We're back with our State of the Union coverage on NBC, and we are just moments away from the Democratic response to the president's speech. Somewhat unconventional choice this year. It's Stacey Abrams, who, of course, drew national attention during her campaign for Georgia's governor last year, lost narrowly, but earned a reputation as someone to watch, a rising political star. We will uh, check in on her address in a moment. But while we have a couple of minutes, let's go to NBC's chief White House correspondent, Hallie Jackson, who watched the speech. And Hallie, what did you hear that surprised you in this speech? speech. There was no declaration of a national emergency, Savannah, which wasn't surprising in and of itself. We had heard that from White House sources that we talked to, that the president was not likely to bypass Congress to be able to find the money that he wanted for that border wall that he wants by doing so. But what was interesting is that it took him about 25 minutes to tee up to immigration. Once he hit it, though, he hit it hard, and Democrats in the room, as you have been talking science. about, were not pleased about this. There were audible the groans class. in the chamber when you heard the president and reference a migrant caravan at one point, for There's example. The president tried to build the case for why he wanted a wall, saying it would prevent bad actors, drugs, for example, from coming across the border. Keep in mind, though, that the majority of both foreigners with criminal records and uh, illegal drugs coming over the border are captured, caught at legal ports of entry, places where a wall wouldn't stop that. You also had the president dealing with semantics a bit. He talked about wanting a smart, strategic see-through barrier. In other words, perhaps enhanced fencing, which you could call it. That is something that Democrats may be able to ultimately get on board with, but with 10 days to go until this second shutdown looms, there's still a question of whether they'll be able to find common ground on that. And, and the president clearly put a lot of things out there that there might be common ground, uh, AIDS, uh, cancer yes. research. Sure. So there's a lot to choose from potentially. Yeah, and listen, he started his speech, the big, a big chunk of it there, talking about criminal justice reform in the First Step Act, which to date has been one of the biggest pieces of policy that his administration has come out with that has had bipartisan support. So I think it was a notable choice. We'd been told before the speech that he was going to talk about criminal justice reform more than expected. I think it's notable that he led with that. That Alice Johnson moment was another special one, Lester. All right, Howie, thank you. Let's end here now from Atlanta. Uh, Georgia is Stacey Abrams. She will have the Democratic response. This is only the second time we've seen someone do the response who does not currently hold elected office. Let's go to Georgia now and Stacey Abrams. Good evening, my fellow Americans, and happy Lunar New Year. I'm Stacey Abrams, and I'm honored to join the conversation about the state of our union. Growing up, my family went back and forth between lower middle class and working class. Yet even when they came home weary and bone tired, my parents found a way to show us all who we could be. My librarian mother taught us to love learning. My father, a shipyard worker, put in overtime and extra shifts, and they made sure we volunteered to help others. Later, they both became United Methodist ministers, an expression of the faith that guides us. These were our family values, faith, service, education, and responsibility. Now, we only had one car, so sometimes my dad had to hitchhike and walk long stretches during the 30-mile trip home from the shipyards. One rainy night, my mom got worried. We piled in the car and went out looking for him, and we eventually found my dad making his way along the road, soaked and shivering in his shirt sleeves. When he got in the car, my mom asked if he'd left his coat at work. He explained that he'd given it to a homeless man he'd met on the highway. When we asked why he'd given away his only jacket, my dad turned to us and said, I knew when I left that man he'd still be alone, but I could give him my coat because I knew you were coming for me. Our power and strength as Americans lives in our hard work and our belief in more. My family understood firsthand that while success is not guaranteed, we live in a nation where opportunity is possible. But we do not succeed alone. In these United States, when times are tough, we can persevere because our friends and neighbors will come for us. Our first responders will come for us. It is this mantra, this uncommon grace of community that has driven me to become an attorney, a small business owner, a writer, and most recently, the Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia. My reason for running was simple. I love our country and its promise of opportunity for all. And I stand here tonight because I hold fast to my father's credo. 
Together, we are coming for America, for a better America. Just a few weeks ago, I joined volunteers to distribute meals to furloughed federal workers. They waited in line for a box of food and a sliver of hope since they hadn't received paychecks in weeks. Making livelihoods of our federal workers a pawn for political games is a disgrace. The shutdown was a stunt engineered by the President of the United States, one that defied every tenet of fairness and abandoned not just our people, but our values. For seven years, I led the Democratic Party in the Georgia House of Representatives. I didn't always agree with the Republican speaker or governor, but I understood that our constituents didn't care about our political parties, they cared about their lives. So when we had to negotiate criminal justice reform or transportation or foster care improvements, the leaders of our state didn't shut down. We came together and we kept our word. It should be no different in our nation's capital. We may come from different sides of the political aisle, but our joint commitment to the ideals of this nation cannot be negotiable. Our most urgent work is to realize Americans' dreams of today and tomorrow, to carve a path to independence and prosperity that can last a lifetime. Children deserve an excellent education from cradle to career. We owe them safe schools and the highest standards, regardless of zip code. Yet this White House responds timidly while first graders practice active shooter drills and the price of higher education grows ever steeper. From now on, our leaders must be willing to tackle gun safety measures and face the crippling effect of educational loans, to support educators and invest what is necessary to unleash the power of America's greatest minds. In Georgia and around the country, people are striving for a middle class where a salary truly equals economic security. But instead, families' hopes are being crushed by Republican leadership that ignores real life or just doesn't understand it. Under the current administration, far too many hardworking Americans are falling behind, living paycheck to paycheck, most without labor unions to protect them from even worse harm. The Republican tax bill rigged the system against working people. Rather than bringing back jobs, plants are closing, layoffs are looming, and wages struggle to keep pace with the actual cost of living. We owe more to the millions of everyday folks who keep our economy running, like truck drivers forced to buy their own rigs, farmers caught in a trade war, small business owners in search of capital, and domestic workers serving without labor protections. Women and men who could thrive if only they had the support and freedom to do so. We know bipartisanship could craft a 21st century immigration plan, but this administration chooses to cage children and tear families apart. Compassionate treatment at the border is not the same as open borders. President Reagan understood this. President Obama understood this. Americans understand this. And Democrats stand ready to effectively secure our ports and borders. But we must all embrace that from agriculture to health care to entrepreneurship, America is made stronger by the presence of immigrants, not walls. And rather than suing to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, as Republican attorneys general have, our leaders must protect the progress we've made and commit to expanding health care and lowering costs for everyone. My father has battled prostate cancer for years. To help cover the cost, I found myself sinking deeper into debt, because while you can defer some payments, you can't defer cancer treatment. In this great nation, Americans are skipping blood pressure pills, forced to choose between buying medicine or paying rent. Maternal mortality rates show that mothers, especially black mothers, risk death to give birth. And in 14 states, including my home state, where a majority want it, our leaders refuse to expand Medicaid, which could save rural hospitals, save economies, and save lives. We can do so much more. Take action on climate change. Defend individual liberties with fair-minded judges. 
but none of these ambitions are possible without the bedrock guarantee of our right to vote. Let's be clear, voter suppression is real. From making it harder to register and stay on the rolls, to moving and closing polling places, to rejecting lawful ballots, we can no longer ignore these threats to democracy. While I acknowledge the results of the 2018 election here in Georgia, I did not, and we cannot, accept efforts to undermine our right to vote. That's why I started a nonpartisan organization called Fair Fight to advocate for voting rights. This is the next battle for our democracy, one where all eligible citizens can have their say about the vision we want for our country. We must reject the cynicism that says allowing every eligible vote to be cast and counted is a power grab. Americans understand that these are the values our brave men and women in uniform and our veterans risk their lives to defend. The foundation of our moral leadership around the globe is free and fair elections, where voters pick their leaders, not where politicians pick their voters. In this time of division and crisis, we must come together and stand for and with one another. America has stumbled time and again on its quest towards justice and equality. But with each generation, we have revisited our fundamental truths, and where we falter, we make amends. We fought Jim Crow with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Yet, we continue to confront racism from our past and in our present, which is why we must hold everyone from the highest offices to our own families accountable for racist words and deeds and call racism what it is, wrong. America achieved a measure of reproductive justice in Roe v. Wade, but we must never forget it is immoral to allow politicians to harm women and families to advance a political agenda. We affirmed marriage equality, and yet the LGBTQ community remains under attack. So even as I am very disappointed by the president's approach to our problems, I still don't want him to fail. But we need him to tell the truth and to respect his duties and respect the extraordinary diversity that defines America. Our progress has always been found in the refuge in the basic instinct of the American experiment, to do right by our people. And with a renewed commitment to social and economic justice, we will create a stronger America together. Because America wins by fighting for our shared values against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That is who we are. And when we do so, never wavering, the state of our union will always be strong. Thank you, and may God bless the United States of America. We've been listening to Stacey Abrams, who, of course, came very close to winning the Georgia governor's race, but did not. She's a Democrat. She was the minority leader of the Georgia House for some time, and that is not an easy thing to do. There are lots and lots of tales of people who've done the opposition party's response, and it's not gone so well for she them. She didn't careers. take the president on directly, but it was clear who she was talking she to. She had 10 minutes. One thing she didn't do is let the Republicans get away with the shutdown. That was something that was not mentioned whatsoever during the State of the Union, but she let them have it. She did. She scolded the president. She said that it was a stunt. It was a stunt engineered by the president of the United States. She said making their livelihoods a pawn for political games is a disgrace. That was a really important statement, a very effective speaker, and also denouncing voter fraud. She says that is real and racism. This was a strong speech, but also at the end saying we don't want the president to fail. We want him to su succeed, but we want him to tell the truth. I thought that she hit a, a lot of strong points there. She's going to be on the ballot in 2020. She's probably running for the United States Senate in Georgia in 2020. Many Democrats are wanting but, but, her to but run you, for that seat. you will, and yes. she did nothing tonight to dissuade them from wanting to recruit her. Well, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was elected to the House from New York last November, just weeks after her 29th birthday. She's a progressive Democrat. 
a favorite target of conservatives and already so well known she can go by just her initials AOC and she joins us from Capitol Hill. Congresswoman, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. The president laid out a lot there, but in the early part of his speech, he talked about governing not as two parties, but one nation, the sense of embracing compromise. Did you hear things you didn't expect to hear that might make you think there's room to work with this president and the, and, and the rest of this Congress? Well, I, I will say most of the speech was pretty disappointing, but there were moments. I do think that the nod to criminal justice reform is one one avenue where we can really come together and advance our common our common uh, cause. I also think that there is a great possibility for us to build and create jobs with mass infrastructure investment. How we make that investment, I think, is obviously up for a debate, and it's a major point of debate. But I think those two issues are very strong ones for us to come together on. He also made points about investigations and suggesting that some of the, I think he called them partisan investigations, mm -hmm. get in the way of, of growing our economy. How did you react to that? Well, I thought it was, uh, frankly, kind of bizarre. I don't think that investigations into federal misconduct have anything to do with our economy. And I mean, the fact of the matter is 3,000 Americans died in a dysfunctional and irresponsible response to Hurricane Maria. We have had children die in, in DHS custody. We have had the, you know, mass violation of human rights and separating children from their parents. And I think that the desire to not investigate that is a partisan request. Um, it, in any administration, no matter what party the president is from, if such dysfunction happened, Congress would have a requirement uh, to, to really investigate those things. And without doing so, we'd be abdicating our responsibility. Congresswoman, before I let you go, there was a moment, a couple of moments in the speech, actually, where the president talked about socialism. He started talking about what's happening, of course, in Venezuela, but then he said, here in the United States, we are alarmed by new calls to adopt socialism in our country. You, of course, mm -hmm. have identified yourself as a democratic socialist. Mm -hmm. Do you think he was talking to you? I mean, I, I think that there's uh, there's certainly a major coincidence, if, if not, you know, if, if that's not the least of it, uh, with me and, and several others coming in in this Congress and him choosing to, to send that message in this State of the Union. But I think ultimately what we see is that the vast, vast majority of Americans believe that you should be able to feed your family on 40 hours a week. And we believe that health care is a right. We believe that uh, work should be dignified. And we believe that all people should be accepted regardless of their race, gender, or ethnicity. Do you think socialism would be a winning message or a winning position in 2020 for Democrats? Yes. Well, I think at the end of the day, it's not about an ism. And I think that that's what the, exactly the president is trying to do. He's trying to mischaracterize, frame, associate, because our policies are so popular, because we advance and fight for improved and expanded Medicare for all, which has a 70 percent approval rating in the American public. It's because we believe in at least a $15 minimum wage. It's because we believe in the labor movement. We believe in the unionization of workers. We believe in uh, we believe in, a, in, a, in an agenda in including a 70 percent marginal tax rate, which now even a, a very large percentage of Republicans have been uh, have been approving of. And so I think what he's seeing is that he's losing the war on the issues. And so he's going to try to go ad hominem. He's going to try to call names. He's going to try to distract. And we're not going to let him do it. We're going to stay focused on our message and our cause. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, freshman congressman from New York. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much. And when the border wall deadlock led to a government shutdown last month, hundreds of thousands of federal workers were stuck without a paycheck for more than a month. That shutdown ended just over a week ago, but the threat of another one remains. So how do workers themselves feel about all this? NBC's Ron Mott is with many of them tonight in Kansas City. Ron, describe the reaction, what you're hearing there. Hey there, uh, Lester. Well, we're at JJ's restaurant here in Kansas City, and I guess the best place to start is Stacey Abrams in the rebuttal said that this was a shutdown engineered by the president. How many of you, a show of hands, believe that? So we've got, it looks like four out of six here. Mark, you didn't uh, believe that the president engineered this shutdown? No, I don't believe so. Do you have any confidence that we won't be here again in 10 days? Uh, I'm not sure. I hope not. I hope we can come to an agreement. I hope, um, you know, I'm kind of tired of all the Washington politics and the arguing back and forth. I'd like to see some um, partisan agreement come to a uh, conclusion on what needs to be done to solve this problem. What about you, Logan? 
If we'd be back here, well, in ten, if he declares a state of emergency, uh, we probably won't be back here. Um, he wouldn't need the Congress. And he didn't mention that tonight. No, he didn't, so do I'm you, hoping he doesn't. Yeah, Stephanie, uh, do you have any confidence that you won't be back here in 10 days looking for a paycheck? Um, I think the president has pretty good gut instincts, and he doesn't think an agreement's going to come. And I, don't, I, I agree with him. I think that he's probably correct. Tanya, you guys were thrust into this. You didn't get to raise your hand and say, yes, I'll go home and not take a paycheck for five weeks. Was this worth it? Is this issue about a wall on the southern border worth it to you as a government worker? No, I do not believe so. I believe that the American worker is, should be more valued than that wall. And lastly, just a sh thumbs up, thumbs down on the president's speech tonight. Looks like we, well, it's a mix, Lester. <laughs> <laughs> up and four down. We'll send it back to you. Imagine that division, division in, uh, <laughs> on the exactly. issue. Uh, you know, I, I think the question asked now, uh, what's the headline tomorrow? What, what, what changes tomorrow as based on this speech, John? I, I think it's, there's real doubt about whether they're going to get a deal. Uh, I think you, you, there's serious question needs to be asked. It's either going to be a shutdown or national emergency. That didn't sound like a president ready to cut a deal. So in that Near term, and you ask what the sort of the fallout from the speech is. I think it. I think it's that. Fifteen minutes of that speech was on the issue of immigration. Is he is he resting the rest of his presidency on this issue? It felt to me, and I thought about this as I was thinking about this speech. The more time he spent on the wall on immigration, the more to me it was a 2020 speech. He seemed to be more worried about his political standing as he heads into 2020, as he heads into fights maybe for his own political future. Everything was about reinforcing that base, even messages to evangelicals, messages to, to the pro-Israel community that he needs to keep close. Everything in this speech was designed to do that. There was a lot of talk of bipartisanship and unity. Do you feel it was a persuasive speech? Not on bipartisanship, not on compromise. I think there, it'll also be remembered for suggesting that investigations are in contrast to war and... Uh, you know, if you have investigations and war, then you won't have economic growth and peace. That is a false choice, and it seems to be a very stark new twist in his uh, You know, that did get a huge growth. applause. That was the one thing that did not get a huge applause. Republicans didn't even stand up for that, for what it's worth. Well, there always are that, you know, you've got the White House and you have Congress, and occasionally Congress says, hey, we are a co-equal branch, and that has yeah. nothing to do with being a Republican or a Democrat, so perhaps that's the dynamic we were seeing there. Well, that can, there's going to be a lot to talk about as we go forward, but that concludes our coverage right now, the 2019 State of the Union, a big night.